So, he's been talking about the Q Pascal triangle, the quantum of the Pascal triangle, or the Q deform Pascal triangle. And we're just about to show how it's related to something called quantum groups. So, we just need to remember a little bit of what we were doing last time. So we got into all sorts of fun stuff last time about the relationship of these zigzag paths, young diagrams, matrices, and row echelon form. But you don't need to remember all that stuff now so much. Although, eventually, you will, I suppose, you need to expect it, you don't need to. But what you really need to remember is we have this kind of recursive procedure for calculating the numbers in the quantum actual triangle by, I guess, starting with the number one up on top and then feeding it down these paths. And sometimes when you feed it along certain paths, it gets multiplied by something. And the way it worked, you sort of derived this from some principles, was that whenever you went on a path that went down to the left, it just got multiplied by one, something fairly exciting there. But when you went on paths that went down to the right, it got multiplied by a power of Q. And these powers were Q to the zero, Q to the one, Q to the two, and so on. So here you get multiplying by Q, and they get multiplied by the squared, and so on. And so the idea is that it's very analogous to the old idea of Pascal's triangle, where you imagine you have a, a ball up on top and has an equal chance to fall down each direction, and then you just let it go any way it wants, and then you see how likely it is to land at some particular point. But here, instead of it being an equal chance to go either direction, it's a more complicated situation uh, because of these cues coming in. And in fact, instead of thinking of it as a chance, go one direction or the other. It's actually even better to think of it as a quantum mechanical amplitude to go in one direction or another. So, in fact, in some applications, it's really good to think of this number Q, not the way we think of it, where you think of it as a prime power. So think of it as a, uh, a unit complex number, also number of phase. And so then your, your, your ball kind of goes down this way with phase one and goes down for this phase one. And then here it picks up a phase two, here it picks up a phase one, so that the total amplitude for it to get here is one plus q, of course. But, but what that is depends on what q is, and depending on what q is, these two different roots could constructively interfere or destructively interfere. So if q is one, you're back down to the normal Pascal triangle. Is negative one, for example, then there'd be no way for the ball to get here because it would just completely cancel out. And that's a very quantum mechanical idea. So there's a thing, one of the first things you learn about when you're learning about quantum mechanics, it's called the two slit experiment, where an electron has two different ways to get from here to there, but each way it gets its wave function gets multiplied by a certain phase. And if those phases are the same, you'll get constructive interference. So you get a good chance for the electron to be there. But if they're opposite, it will cancel out. You'll just never get the electron to be there. And that was one of the things that people found very strange about quantum mechanics was sometimes opening up more ways for something to happen makes it less likely to happen because you have interference. So, so this is the quantum Pascal triangle in that sense. That's one sense in which it deserves to be called quantum. And it's a very nice way to think about it if you think of Q as a phase. which is an eight or even a complex number. But mathematically, it doesn't matter what kind of number it is. For applications, for some weird reason, it wants to be a prime power, which is also very strange, because phases and prime powers are completely different concepts. And that's probably, probably if we understand how they fit together, we'll understand some of the crazy stuff in mathematics. Yep. Well, what happens to that normal distribution if you, if you toggle the, the value of Q and start? Jim was asking us to draw a graph of it. So, 
expression will in general be complex numbers down here, but again, a probability you take the absolute value of them square it. You can actually graph that and it should be really interesting to do. It should be a Gaussian of Q's one, but then it becomes some weird thing otherwise. I thought it would be too, I was just imagining it would be very more over peaked compared to a Right, if Q is a positive, yeah, Q is two, then it's like, it likes to, I don't know what it likes to do. <laughs> it puts, it makes it eight No, but it's always symmetrical though. So yeah, remember, right. the binomial coefficients are always, we, what we saw, heuristically, in some examples, they improve that. Q binomial coefficient over here is equal to what it's over here. So why? They always be symmetrical. Um, but I don't know what it looks like. It's all in plus, though, but that's a good thing. Right. Let's just go around the unit circle and see what you think about it. That's what I would say. Um, does anyone know a physical situation where you it's really true that if you move around one way and move around another way, you get amplitude you that differ by a phase? Actually, let me make the question a bit more more sharp. So Notice that in this particular situation, whenever you go around, you have two different routes from here down to here. What's the relationship between the phase that you get this way and the phase that you get that way? Q. This one is always Q times this one. Right? Because when you, these are ones, this will be Q to the something. I guess it's Q to the K. And this will always be Q to the K plus one or more. So, you, so the phase going around this way is always Q times the phase that way. And there's a split. Sorry? That's Q squared. That's the bottom um, yeah. 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 So, so, So the process of going around one way picks up a phase Q more than the process of going around the other way. And so, called the Bohm-Aharonoff effect. If you have a if you have a constant magnetic field that's out the plane, you place into the plane or out of the plane, and you have a charged particle, and you let the particle take two different possible routes to get from somewhere to somewhere else, the amplitudes for those two differ by a phase. That's the ratio of the jump to some phase, and that phase is e to the i times the integral of the magnetic field through that surface, normal component through that surface. So, <laughs> so really, if you actually put a charged particle in the passable triangle device, and you have a magnetic field pointing perpendicular to the plane of the device, it will actually do exactly this. So you can, in fact, try to do it. You have like an electron with uh, gravity, you may want to fall down. So probably too light for this to work very well. For an actual electron. Some kind of charged particle that's heavy, you could make it. So, so you could say that another way to think about this is that it's a passive triangle in a magnetic field. Now, what I want to do is I want you to see how this thing is related to the binomial theorem. So, in the ordinary binomial theorem, with ordinary binomial coefficients, we have x plus y to the n is the sum of terms and the coefficient of x to the k, y to the n minus k is the binomial coefficient, of course, but what it really is is the sum of overall paths from the top of your triangle down to the specific location the n, k location in your triangle, and it's just counting those paths. Uh, and it's obviously n choose k because you have k different ways to choose when you go to the left as you go down, and n minus k ways to go to the right to get to a specific location of the grid. So you have to pick k left portions out of the total band steps of falling down the grip, falling down the machine. So now that's what it is for the normal Pascal triangle. But now we want to think about what's going to happen to this formula, to this binomial coefficient formula. So 
with a Q Pascal triangle, quantum Pascal triangle. So, well, I can tell you what's going to happen to it. <laughs> I'm going to want a formula like this where the binomial coefficients get replaced by Q binomial coefficients. That's what I want. But the question is, how can you make this formula make sense? Of course, it's not true for, for, for our original interpretation of the variables x and y. So we need to somehow reinterpret what we mean by x and y, what properties they have, to get this new weird modified binomial formula to hold. And can someone give me a hint as to what's got to change? It's better not to commute. All we needed to get the binomial theorem to work was that they commuted. Right? So you, you multiply this thing out, you get lots of terms with k x's and n minus k y's arranged in all possible orders. And then you just commute the x's past the y's to get them all the x's in front of the y's. And that gave us the binomial theorem. But now we're going to get a different answer here. It better not commute. It better, yeah? Okay. It better commute. That's right. Because we know that if you go down this way and then this way, you don't get the same answer as if you go down this way and this way. The two procedures differ by a factor of Q. So in fact, I think the way I've got it set up here, I think the hard part is for me to remember which way, which moving which way corresponds to X and which way corresponds to Y. But I seem to remember that the way I had arranged it last time was that this was the K equals zero line, the K equals one line, the K equals two line, and so on. So that means that if we use this type of formula, this X really just a shorthand for moving one step in, in this direction to increasing k, but not changing n minus k. So instead of labeling these things by phases now, I will need to draw the diagram. So I have the old diagram. But to sort of think of this as like a name for the process, taking one step to the right, and taking one step to the left, which you can have so those are names for these somewhat mysterious so far processes of moving along these paths. And what we know is that going down this way and this way should get you Q times what you get as if you go down this way and this way. So, so we get something like x times y is q times y x, or possibly the other way around. If we have one more convention that we get to fiddle with, if we get really confused. Okay. In addition, yeah, what? Well, we want to decide what order you want to write it. You know, y first then x, and we do left to right or right to left. Right. right. So if I go x first and then y, what does everyone in the world call that? X y. No, Y X. Y X. Makes sense. No, everyone calls it Y X, right? Yeah. If you apply a function to something, and then you apply another function to it, the one you do second, you write first, right? Because some idiotic decision made in pre-history that we can never undo, right? So, so if you compose two operators, X and Y, it means do Y first for normal people, okay? So we just have to decide. Jim, of course, is sensible. He does it the other thing. He can do X first. Um, and so, so I'm just sort of doomed at this point. But I think I'll attempt to do it the normal way. Because at some point, we're actually going to think of these X and Y as being some kind of operator we're going to apply to something. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm going to a craven creature of tradition. I'm just going to apply it on the left-hand side, the way everyone else does. So, OK. So now that you know the convention, and what you write second means you do it first. Then, then what's the relation? That x y is q times y x. Really? Yeah. Oh good. <laughs> that don't work out. I wanted it. I wanted uh, it to work out the other way, but I, 
but, uh, but there's so many different well, choices of dimensions. So if he says it's doing this, and then this, yeah, that's right, it's Q times this. Okay, that's how it's working out. Okay, that's not the way I really wanted it to work out, but to get it to work out in one way, I have to change some other dimension. All of a sudden, yeah. Um, so the way you prove the classical binomial, one way to prove the classical binomial formula, uh -huh. which is essentially what you are going to do there is to count parts. Uh -huh. If you do the induction from the previous row, so you just add a part ending up at this point or a part ending up at that point, and both go down. Uh -huh. Which means this is the, so it's basically the relation you're using to prove this classical binomial formula is the relation between n to k and n minus 1 to k and n That's minus right. So last time we worked out the classic recursion relation that tells you a binomial coefficient in terms of the two up here, but we worked out the cuneiform case. So one way to try to prove this kind of thing would be to try to use that. Exactly. Right. But now in the in the quantum case, the the thing the factors to the binomial coefficients do not add up. They add up with the weight of u to the something, which I think you said at one point. Because that's the q to form. That's the q to form. We can try to so use that to prove this. So if you want to get this answer in the end, we have to make sure that we have some modified powers of q to compensate those q things. But you're making it sound really complicated and tricky. So I'm going to do it a really simple minded way. Yes. Which won't get me embroiled in that. I don't even know if that's true that you need to do some trick to compensate for something. You but I don't even want to think about yeah. that. Because if I do, I'll fight. You know, when the sense you start paying attention to all the legs, it just can't walk anymore. I'm already having enough trouble here because I have to decide. I have to decide whether I'm going to call this X or this one X. That already gets me completely arbitrary choice. Then I have to decide whether I, whether in this expression I mean you're doing y first or y second. That's another arbitrary choice. So I'm up to two squared conventions here. Then. And so I'm just barely hanging on for y second. You know, to be as simply as possible now. It and just like you're not going to get this formula, you're going to get the formula with the y x now. Right. And luckily, something will stay us. But let's, yeah. let's move. Over out. <laughs> and then we're back. And then let's let's just see. So we're going to oh, yeah. we're going to accept we're going to accept uh, this as our relationship. And then let's just sort of see what happens. Some of you may not be interested in this, but let's just think about working out some examples of the binomial form. So here we get x squared. That really means to move to the right points. And then you get x, y, which means right, left. No, left, right. And then you get y, x, and then you get y squared. So you get two to the n terms for an n power here. For n is two. Uh, but then you get to use your q mutation relations to mutate one of these terms. And so Right now, the way these relations seem to work is that the way they seem to want to work is they want to help you push y to the front and get factors of q. So, so what we're getting is 1 plus q times y x plus y squared. Uh, and then 1 plus q, if that's the correct q binomial coefficient. I'll just do one more. No, but this is not what you started. What well, it is not so pleasant. So, like I said, this is a network of interlocking conventions. I just thought I could just write a Q in the original formula and, and that would work out. But we'll, we'll see what happens again. So, so, here we get X cubed, right? And then you get three terms with a one Y in it, but then you have to move that Y to the front using this relation various numbers of times. So, you can move it. Either in the front or in the middle or in the back. And so you push it up to the front in any case. And then you get the same kind of thing that you get now a term with two y's and an x. You can think of this as you've got an x somewhere and you want to push it to the back using this relation. And it could be either in the back, in the middle, or in the front. And then you get your one. So this is, these are also, again, the correct q binomial coefficients. Choose one, and you can choose two. 
So, so what we're getting here is what the pattern seems to be is that x plus y is equal to n, sum, n equals, sorry, k equals 0 to n of these q binomial coefficients n choose k with y in front, y to the k, and x to the m minus k. So it's different for the q. Of course, you want to do that, you have to do that. I just did prove it, huh? I mean, I, I, mean, well, I, mean, I remember this. This thing was defined to be the sum over these ah. weighted tabs of these okay. powers of q, and we're seeing that it's exactly working, that each time you go to the left once and then the right, you get q times when you go the other way, right? And so you know it's going to work. You don't have to like damn do some extra thing to prove it. You put in four conventions in between. What? Two square conventions. Sure, but I mean, I, but uh, I was, I mean, I didn't, I don't understand your objection. I mean, um, any idiot can prove it given, given this. We don't need to do any further verification, right? So we just say that this, any term in here will consist of a list of x's and y's, a total of n of them, right? That corresponds to a zigzag path that makes k left hand moves and n minus k right hand moves. And um, this thing is defined to be the sum over such things, but we know that if you make the maximally right hand path, you'll get a it's just a one, but then if you start making make paths that move more over to the left, you'll get powers of Q that correspond precisely to these the areas of these kind yeah. of Young diagrams. And the area of these Young diagrams is built up by adding up, just by counting these boxes. But we know that each one of these boxes, what it really stands for is that you have a choice of going this way and that way, or that way and this way. And those two ways are called X and Y. And so we have it set up to work, right? So this is doing x and then y. Then y and then x. So, so it works. You just need to explain that so the phone understands it and they know it's true. So, um, okay, so what we've got here is this funny thing, this funny situation where we have these processes, x and y, which you can think of as processes of moving in two different directions, but they don't commute anymore. They satisfy a non trivial commutation relation. Now we're used, of course, to um, commute. For different <coughs> situations where we have two variables called x and y that commute. So we're used. To the, the, we're used to uh, polynomial functions on the plane. Polynomial functions on the plane. That's a certain algebra. People would often just call it. Well, if you're used to complex functions, you call it C bracket x y. But let's just take any old field. So. Pick a field K, and when I say the plane, I mean the plane K squared. And when I talk about function, I mean value of K. I want to just leave open what kind of field I want. But you can think of K as being R or C, if you like. So we're used to polynomial functions on two on the plane. And those are just functions, polynomials with two commuting variables. One way to think about that is that you first form the algebra generated by two variables that might not necessarily commute. I don't even know if there's a standard notation for that. So this henceforth means the algebra generated by two variables that might not commute. This is the three associated algebra on two variables. It is a standard notation? Okay. Also there are also slightly different flavored brackets for different. Well, if, you at, if you look at this, the vector space in that basis, it's talking about the tensor algebra. Right. This is the tensor algebra on A squared. Yes. 
So then we mod out by the ideal generated by the relation x, y equals y. That's x, y minus y equals zero. That's what we're used to. And so what we somehow got pushed into thinking about, just to get this binomial coefficient theorem to, to work, in the Q to Barn case, is to modify that. So now we're thinking about what, what they call the quantum plane. Or you could call it the Q deform plane. You might even call it the quantum torus in some context. But listen, the quantum plane. So I'll call it maybe K sub Q XY. And that's another algebra. So it's not a plane, that's for sure. But it is it's a, a non-commutative algebra. Non-commutative but associative algebra. Generated by two variables. And then satisfying this modified commutation relation, XY. So, so this first idea is something quite sensible. You're studying the plane, but you're studying it by studying the functions on it, which form a commutative algebra. And that's really the basic idea of algebraic geometry. You study spaces by studying the functions on the plane, right? I mean, polynomial functions. This is some weirdo version where there's no space anymore, so there's no functions on it, because it's not a commutative algebra. Um, but you act as if the, these, the elements of this algebra were functions on some kind of weird space, which is called sometimes a, what you call a quantum space, sometimes this is called non commutative geometry, where you're trying to act as if you're doing algebraic geometry, but then you're applying its ideas to non commutative associated algebra. And it's sort of a make-believe kind of process that we want to ponder and try to understand. So let me just say a little bit about this kind of stuff. Some of you know all about this stuff already, but I just sort of want to remind you a little bit about, about basic idea of algebraic geometry and then this new version of algebraic geometry where your algebras aren't committed to anymore. So, let me just sort of say where we're going with all this stuff. I need to say something about that. So, we started out studying the humble binomial coefficients. We categorified them. We saw that they had to do with subsets of a set. Then we q deformed them by thinking about subspaces of a vector space over a field with two elements. Then we saw to <coughs> understand the binomial theorem. We need to think about polynomials and two variables don't commute anymore. We don't know what those variables mean particularly. We know that they have something or other to do with moving down the two directions in this triangle. That's all we know. We know that somehow we're in some situation of going ding ding, it's not the same as going ding ding anymore. But I didn't really say what x and y were in any very precise sense. Uh, but what we mainly know is they've got to satisfy some kind of commutation relation to get the binomial term for work. So x and y are somewhat mysterious entities, and what our goal is is to try to eventually make them not at all mysterious, to understand what these x's and y's are. And so what we're going to try to do is uh, make this somewhat mysterious non commutative geometry idea into something that's sort of less mysterious, at least in this example. And why are we going to do that? Well, part of why is because this quantum plane is just the beginning of a whole big story. It's very interesting. So first of all, of course, you might consider quantum higher dimensional things than just a plane. But just sticking with a quantum plane for a second, what, what happens is something like this. So this group GL2 with coefficients in our field K, this acts on the plane, the ordinary plane, k squared. So it acts on the functions on the plane. Okay. 
then it actually plane by linear transformation. So I have this linear transformation first. So if you think of this plane, which is a two-dimensional vector space, it's symmetry here, which is all the convertible linear transformations of a two-dimensional vector space, and that's GL. Okay. So it's not just that it acts, it really is the, all the symmetry of this plane, all of this vector space. And so that means it knows how to act on the on the coordinate functions x and y, so it acts on the acts on the polynomial functions, uh, which are polynomials in this coordinate. Um, so, so I mean that's all very simple. I'm just saying GL2 acts on the plane. Um, but now we've got this quantum plane, and so the question is, what are the symmetries of that? So for this thing, we know what it is, the group. We know what type of entity it is. The question of what the symmetries of the quantum plane are is so weird that the answer isn't even a group. You might think that well, as soon as you talk about symmetries, you're talking about a group. But, but it was discovered that the concept of symmetry takes on some strange mutant version when you go into non commutative geometry. And so there's something called a quantum group, and I'll just call it GLQ2. Okay. And it acts on, well, there's no, it's not really any quantum plane. It's really a function of the quantum plane. But that's what we call a quantum plane. So it acts on the quantum plane, which is this non and I, this group is in, it's not really a group, because the whole concept of action just has to be modified. I have to explain what I mean by action. I'm sort of looking at that computer. So, so the point is that people discovered that this huge deformation process that we're talking about, it, it's sort of all pervasive in mathematics. It starts, it gets, it starts deforming all sorts of things. And so in particular, you can take some of your favorite legal groups, for example, all the simple Lie groups, so the GLM, and there's a way to the form of the into these new entities called quantum groups. And in one sense, you could say that one thing I've been interested in for ages is trying to understand what are what's the real meaning of quantum groups and our meaning of quantum groups. And there's probably not one answer to that question, but I didn't like any of the answers that I've seen so far, and so. Here we'll see a particular answer coming from this field with two elements. Okay, but now I want to say a little bit about what a quantum group actually is. So, I think we'll do that. So, to do that, I need to tell a little story that some of you know very well, which is sort of the, the story of algebraic geometry. But I'll do it in fast, fast motion. So, the idea. Is algebraic geometry is all about studying spaces by studying the functions on the spaces. And geometry is nice because you can visualize things. Algebra is nice because you can compute things. And Algebraic geometry and try to have the best of both worlds. So the idea is someone hands you a space X, you look at the algebra of functions on that space. So you, you turn it into a commutative algebra. And then you call it O of X. Algebra of functions on X. Now you'll notice that I'm being incredibly vague, but that's because I'm so precise. So I didn't say what kind of space I was talking about, and I didn't say what kind of functions either. And that's on purpose because you're supposed to think about all the different possibilities that you know. So, for example, if you know about topological spaces, then you should think of these as, say, continuous, perhaps real valued functions, or maybe complex values. And then there's a theorem that, that for example, compact host curve spaces can be completely recovered from the algebra of functions on them. It's called the Gelfand-Nymark theorem. 
But the kind of functions we're talking about right now aren't like continuous functions so much as they're like polynomial functions that algebraically be presented that have nice primary presentation. So you might want to think of this state as the kind of space for which the concept of polynomial function makes sense. And I guess that kind of space would be called an affine algebraic variety. And then here I would mean the algebraic function on that. But that's technical enough that I don't even really want to mainly get into that. But I just want to indicate that there's a vast variety of interpretations here and here. And there's a lot of different worlds in which you talk about spaces and functions on spaces, and you kind of get a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between these things. You try to be able to get that from your algebra to your space, and then you're really happy to go back and forth between the geometry and the algebra point. So, but I just want to sort of talk about a couple of things. So besides spaces, of course, you need to talk about maps between spaces. You want your spaces to form some kind of category, some kind of map. So if there's topological spaces, you can continuous maps, relative variety, you can have algebraic maps described by polynomials. And what happens over here? Some one of you for whom this is not like stuck in the Yeah? Contravariance. You've got a contravariance thing. You've got a thing that's called the pullback. What type of entity is that thing? Is it an algebra? Yeah. It's an algebra map. Okay, it's something like a two category. Boring old people call it an algebra homomorphism. Algebra homomorphism. Algebra homomorphism says E pull back going from O to Y to O to X is contravariant because it's going backwards because what it does is it takes any function on Y and turns it into a function on X by composing it with C. So if you think about it, it gives us some kind of contravariant feed side pullback, side and pullback, C pullback. They get turned around. So, um, so that's so that's the idea. So what you really want to have is a functor from this category of spaces to this category of algebra, an algebra homomorphism, but it's going to be a contravariant functor. Uh, so that's part of the game. But then the idea is that then you can do all sorts of things with spaces, and in particular, for example, you can talk about groups. I'm trying to explain what a quantum group is. So a group, well a group is for starters a space. By the way, another thing you can mean by space is just a set. Right? So, it can be all. so a group is a begin with a space. So like a topological group, a Lie group, an algebraic variety is also a group, a algebraic group. But anyway, it's a space. So it's a space. But it's a space with a bunch of operations. So it has this multiplication map. It has this inverse map. And it has this identity element. Well, it's annoying that I said map, map, element. So you have to turn it into a map. So how does the identity element of the group turn into a map? I think you get to think of it as a map. Not only scratch to the term of it. a fundamental question. But I'm trying to turn all, here I got spaces and maps. I don't want to say the word element, because I won't know what to do over there. So, more to them from the initial object. Ah, the initial The initial object? How many morphisms are there from the initial object? Then? One. One. The, the term of it. Yes, right. For some reason, the terminal object, aka the one point set, the terminal world set, the thing that there's only one way to map two, but that makes an incredibly fun map from. Right? So the main thing you do with the terminal object is map from, not to it, to it, to it, to it. 
Yeah, so, you, so if, we're, if we're talking about, this means the one point space, and then you just map that one point space to that one point in the elements of the group, and that's how you think of the identity elements of the map, and then such that a bunch of equations hold, which you can write as community diagrams in this category. Okay, and the reason why that's so great is because then you can just take this definition of a group and zip it over here with your functor, your contravariant functor, and you see what you get. So we'll get something called a Hopf algebra. Well, actually called a commutative Hopf algebra. And the definition of a commutative Hopf algebra is just what you read off of this chart. In other words, what is what is it? So you started with the group, you get the functions on the group, so that's a commutative algebra, just because the group is in space. So for starters, it's a commutative algebra. But then it gets a bunch of operations coming from these operations. But because it's contravariant, these are actually co-operations. So we get like these pullback again going from functions on G to functions on G times G. And in, when you're in nice situations, functions on something times something, that algebra, that's what? Tensor product. Yeah, it's the tensor product. So it should be functions on the first something, that algebra, tensor, the other algebra. So let's assume that we're in that nice situation. Otherwise, um, and so then you can do the same kind of thing for every all the other structures that you have. So the inverse map turns into a algebra homomorphism from functions on G to functions on G, and then the identity finding map. Sometimes they call this the identity finding map. Then the element in the finding map goes from O of G to O of 1. Can you go to starring all those that are like this starring all of them? Yeah, there's no E star. Oh. Yeah. I could O them all. I could write an O in front of them. That's what I really should have done. But I guess it's. Yeah. Oh, yeah, correct. In star. Thanks. Now what should O of 1 be? Come on, John, you know what O of 1 is. It's the initial object. It's the, yeah. it's the initial object. Yeah. So what are the functions on a one-point set like? That's how I would uh, lowbrow or something of it. What are the functions on a one-point set? Numbers, right? So, so this is just your numbers, and what are we calling our numbers today? K. K. Right. We, you know, we have some field or other. You can be even more general, but first, let's take some field, and that will be our field of numbers. So our functions will be got in K. Uh, yes. And so that's that's the that's the of this. I was just going to say that this one of the terminal space of the initial commutative algebra of the field K. Otherwise, not this. Um, and right, so these get funky names. They're called co multiplication. I thought I was going to say co inverse, but no. Antipode and co unit. But you can see that's just the like obscure That's to make it seem as if you know a lot of weird stuff. Huh? That's half of that. That's right. Is that half of the big Oh. That's what I just said. Half of the part of my time is like coming up with weird names. Is it obscure at the beginning? No, half is the dual of the other half. I'm quite sure I understand what you're saying. No, this one is half of the D to one, and the diagonal is embedding from D to D to D. Right. So this such that is. 
take your actions for a group, you write them as a community of diagrams, and you write the same diagrams here, but you just turn all the arrows around. So it's like code such that. Such that the, such that the same stuff, but it's a document. Do you do that such that with this such that? What? Such that, such that those are maps or varieties or whatever you want to say. It comes from the fact that these are algebra maps. Right. So this such that wasn't that they're maps or varieties. This such that they were all oh, that thinking thing all the actions for the group. Your right. social diagram. Ah. <laughs> when you reach a certain level of sophistication in mathematics, as you've probably seen at conferences, people will say what the, what the stuff is, or say what the structure is, they don't even bother to say what the property is. They'll just be like, eh, I know there's some equations that hold. Yeah. When you first run into it, it's like telling me the group is the thing that has the multiplication, inverse, and identity, and ah, I know there's some equations that hold. Well, but see, but after a certain amount of working with all sorts of mathematical structures, you know, I can figure that out, I can deal with that, I can look it up when I need to. The hard part is not that, the hard part is sort of more general concepts. That's what I'm looking for. So, yeah. so I've seen people say, such that some accidents hold. <laughs> <laughs> Which is incredibly big, but it's whatever it is. Okay, so this is just a subset of duals of all those accidents hold. Hit those accidents with your contrary functions. Okay, so. So that's what a community of Hopf algebra is. It's a community of algebra with this co-multiplication, antipode, co-unit, such that the group actions hold with all the factors. And now, when we go into the realm of non-commutative geometry, we just scratch out the word commutative and hope that we still somehow survive. Right? The hope that we're still doing something that makes sense. So, Yeah. Um, so such that these actions should give you so, so does it give you for free that the other two actions also the I mean what's that? Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the other two. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna say that this is a co algebra with an antipode and that it's oh but it's also an algebra. We ever need to know what those actions are. I'll I'll tell you. Okay. I'm not I'm, I'm not asking that like a general knowledge sort of thing. Right. 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 Oh, okay, you want actions though. I want to know the definition of a hot dog. I know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know how that works. It's a two algebra. It's just because well, that, that's what you would call it. It's just the so the associative type. law over here for M that's turned into some thing you call the co associative law for this co multiplication. And so you say you've got a co algebra with a co Right. So all I was just asking you, so this is, first of all, it's an algebra in such, because that's what it's the yeah. category of. That's right. Then it's also a co-algebra. That's right. Then it also has an antipode map. That's right. And the compatibility of these maps is good, it, it is provable. Okay. Like, you just try starting off with that data, then you can't prove it. Yeah, we, we're, we have this functor from spaces to right. algebras and and, and, right. and so we'll take a monoid to a co-monoid in the world of algebra. Right. And that's called a bi-algebra. So and and that's 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 all your favorite bi-algebra actions will just follow up. Okay. And okay. then it also has that's an right. antipode, and that makes it be called an odd algebra. Yeah, it will all follow up. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm perfectly happy to answer your question. But like, will all my favorite actions right. follow that's up? That's all that's all that's all that's all that's I'm favorite to answer None. 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 X. So what does that mean? Namely, most of all, it means that there's a map from G time to X to X. And then such that some identity can write into this diagram. And so when we turn this over to the world of, uh, of algebra, then what we get is that a, a commutative Hopf algebra Okay. 
got community hot house there. Oh, look, see. We'll say coax. On the community algebra. Well, that. And the main thing that means is that you have the map of the star, the algebra homomorphism going from functions on x to functions on g times x. So let's assume we're in the ninth situation with our functions on g and to functions on x. So it's called co-action because it's going backwards compared to left, and it has to satisfy an action that came from the other side. So it's almost like it's almost like thinking of this action as multiplying a group element times something in the space. And this is almost just factoring that group element back out in the sense. Which group element? This isn't a group element. No. <laughs> it's, it's like factoring that space element into all of the different pairs of group elements and space elements that multiply. Right. right. That's, yeah. That's sort of like sort that. I mean, but, right. but you're doing it a funny thing there because you're talking about a group element or a space element in here. But of course these things are not yeah. elements. They're not even linear combinations of elements. They're really functions on it. So you're doing this little trick of mixing up measures on a space, which are like linear combinations of elements in space. Functions on the space. Yeah. You can do for finding sets, but not the same set. But so you have to be very careful. Um right. And so so then the idea of the non-commutative geometry game is you take all these kind of definitions that I've been talking about, which you just sort of crank out using the R contravariant functor, and then you just scratch out by hand the word non-commutative. So the word commutative. So so GL, so this mysterious quantum group. GL2K. Whatever it is, I still told you what it is. It's a it's a hot algebra. But it's not a commutative one. It's a non-commutative hot algebra. Do you, do you have to like, force the non-commutativity from the top down, or is there any way you can fiddle with your basic data such that the resulting stuff will be not Well, I mean just have to I just sort of thought, so I've switched from thinking about generalities to thinking about a very specific example. And in the specific example, it's just the fact that it is not commutative. And I just felt like adding that. So, uh, so I mean, the, the, state, the sense in which it got forced to be non commutative has something or other to do with the fact that this quantum plane is a non commutative algebra. Can I ask something that you can sure. Okay, yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, uh, you, you, we didn't make any mention of the idea of co but, yeah. uh, but usually over here, we require non commuta and non commuta for quantum group, right? To be really non Yeah, but yeah. Because we can construct non commutative but co commutative compound Right. Which we can go one of the quantum group. Yeah. yeah. I'll mainly ignore that because it's sort of going. Assuming that you already have some fondness for the idea of co commutativity, which I haven't introduced yet. So the, the, the functor that, if you use not going to take this functor, the one, so it was my non commutative Sorry? Yeah. I mean, there's no guarantee that this is commutative. I don't know if you can force such to be non commutative and non co commutative, but. Well, stuff you get from this functor is always commutative, right? But so now we're just sort of saying, uh, let's not use the functor, let's just make up. Off algebras and try to get them to coax on algebras. Yes, I mean, the only thing you're doing non commutative geometry, so you're definitely not insisting on this commutative algebra function. Right, right, yes. Yeah. There's no guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. You have the systematic way of turning geometry into commutative algebra, and then this completely crazy idea of just saying, okay, now I've got my algebra ideas that I'm talking about, I'll just cross out the word commutative and hope it still applies. But, yeah, but crossing out a word is not very systematic. <laughs> 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 right. yeah, yeah. Moving properties from something is tough because you might, you don't know which, you don't know which, you might be wrong out and you pull out one thing. Right. Right. Yeah. 
So, so it's just it's in a hard algebra. It's happens to be non It's coax. Coax is the quantum plane, which is a non commutative algebra. That's the definition. And so you can say that what it's going to be is it's going to be the symmetry, all the symmetry in some sense of the quantum plane. Just like GL2 with all the symmetry of the, the plane, the linear plane. Um, so I still haven't told you what it is, but we'll eventually get around to that. So the point is that so far all we really know about is the quantum plane, but then we're going to get into quantum groups in this class. And it's going to be how it's going to show up. Okay. Now, yep. So last time you said you were going to do two things. You have done one of them. So the two things were the key binomials um, here, which we've done. And the question of why, so the key binomials are the symmetry between two, is one is the symmetry of the other. Yeah, yeah. One is the palindrome. Yeah. We've done the palindrome, but we've not seen why. That's right. I haven't shown you why the quantum pastoral triangle is. I'm not forgetting it, but I'm, I'm, I'm just moving with a glacial pace towards tackling that kind of question. Um, so, I probably won't get to it today, but it's sort of, we're going to get to it. Okay. And I need to rotate break machinery. And so, part of what I need to do here is to get to think about a bunch of questions where the answer is always going to be. And, <laughs> and well, I'm not going to make you think of the questions. We're going gonna, gonna to plant a bunch of questions in your mind. And I'll tell you right now what the answer is. So he, he raised one of them, which is what the type of mathematical structure we really need to really deeply understand the symmetry of the Pascal triangle. And it's Hecka. The other one. The other question is, what, what do we need to understand to really understand what's going on with this quantum plane? So far, this quantum plane is very formal, and what do we need to really understand? It's a paragraph. But. Well, you're the you want to give us the one line answer to write it? No, 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 no. I don't, I don't want to completely spoil it. <laughs> oh, yes, so, the answer. <laughs> I gave you answers. That's all you can get. I think I got a great question. <laughs> so, so, okay. So, so the problem with non commutative geometry is that it's sort of unmotivated in certain sort of form. So, to make it less, so to make non commutative geometry, that's very lofty, to make non commutative geometry less formal. But a very concrete goal is. This Q binomial formula. To make them less formal. So that's a very concrete thing. You've got this formula for figuring out the nth power of x plus y to the n. But x and y are just these things that don't, formal variables that don't commute, except for this weird Q mutation relation. Uh, we want to understand more deeply. What we can do is we can sort of go back, go back to the basics here. So, what I mean by that, we started out talking about binomial coefficients, just in the ordinary way that people do, as being natural numbers. Then what we did was the sort of Serious thing of Q deformed. And I could have defined the Q deformed binomial coefficients without telling you what was really going on. I could have just written down the definitions of them and they would seem like some mysterious new conversion of binomial coefficients. And then it could have been come with some kind of revelation that they really turn out to be polynomials. 
But I actually didn't torture you that way. What I did first was I was I tried to really understand what the binomial coefficients are. What the binomial coefficients are is they're telling you how many k element subsets there are of an n element set. So to really understand that, I should think about it. I should think about it as a thing. And thinking about a number as a thing is called categorifying. What I really did is I categorified it. I said, I use the same symbol down here. Now this means the collection of k element subsets of n, our favorite n element subsets. So I thought about it as a finite set. So in fact, I did the first category of it, then I uniformed it. And because it was a thing, and another thing, namely the set, very least the set, of, of the gross money of k-dimensional subspaces of an n-dimensional vector space. And I could do it for the field with q elements, or if I like, I could do it for any field. Maybe I'll do it for the field. So then, once you see that I'm talking about your money, and then you can just count the points, and that's this number. So this is just a number above, but it's really a number of points in a set. Of course, this is more than just a set. It's something like a variety. It's a corresponding algebraic variety. Uh, and so the question of what type of entity, what kind of structure we really want to think about it in pattern, that's a little bit mysterious so far. It could be, if all you care about was corresponding, you might be talking about something like varieties, algebraic varieties over the field of Q. Maybe it's something like that. But then we started playing games where we took that variety and we chopped it up into these pieces, these through hot cells, because we saw that we could write the number as a sum of terms, and we saw that I had a nice correspondence between corresponding and writing it, breaking it up into pieces, which is through hot cells. But that way of breaking it up into pieces is not disjoint unions of algebraic varieties. So it's not adding varieties to get a big variety. So, so that's why I'm putting a big question mark here and not accepting it. Right. I think it really is bogus. <laughs> because I've seen someone talk about Ray hypotheses and motives, and they do the example of the projective space and how you can chop projective space up into these different three hot cells. In fact, I like a simple example of motives. So motives are some mysterious sort of atomic building blocks that you can decompose on three hot cross So maybe it's motives. Anyway. Now, we're trying to understand things like the Q binomial formula and the quantum plane. And you see it has it should have a different light in each four corner, the four corners here. So so up in this corner, it's just if I have two formal variables x and y and they commute, and I work out the nth power of x plus y, I get these numbers shown up. Over here, it's similarly formal, but now they don't change the Q. Down here, we haven't talked about what it is yet. We haven't talked about what the binomial coefficient, what the binomial formula means as something in the world of finite sets. Although we know it must have something to do with finite sets, because it's coefficients. And similarly, we haven't talked about it down here, like a categorical level. Figuring it out at the categorified level, we can really understand what x and y are, and then they become these formal variables when they can categorize. But uh, I should say then this is including inclusion, not including inclusion. But, but the, well, the kind of thing I want to ask is, write down that binomial formula over here. What is x? What type of entity is x down here at the categorified level? Up here, it's just Right, I just have these formal variables that can be x plus y to the n. I write it out as some linear combination. And, x, x and over here, you're not going to ask me what x is. Just x. Down here, it should be something interesting. It's the 
becomes this informal variable in the category file. X is a new and y is a new. Right, it has something to do. I've already given it partially away. But X and Y have something to do with the process of moving down this way and then moving down that way on the Pascal triangle. And in this ordinary Pascal triangle, they commute. In the non ordinary one, they, they don't commute. Um, but the question is what type of entity are these X and Y really? So, Mark, we don't say. I told you I was going to ask you some questions. Oh, they're head operators. They're head operators, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's think about that a little bit. Just a little bit. So, let's think about the Q deform case. Then we'll get most mileage out. So let's look at M choose K sub F for any Q. So this is the Grassmann the set of k-dimensional subspaces of F to the N. And then we have these two ways to march further down our Pascal's triangle. And I'll probably get them mixed up. But this I think is n plus one choose k. Here I'm adding one. I'm trying to stick to the same convention. But and then the paths sort of reunite down here. And these are these paths that don't commute in our Q to form Pascal's triangle. One of them I call X, and one of them I call Y. No clue. So, but we need to know. It's called the left Y. So, you know the other one. I'm completely trusting. It's N plus 2 in the bottom, isn't it? Sorry? <laughs> What are these things, X and Y? We have no idea. So, we don't even really know what, what the rules of the game are at this particular stage. But let's think about it. Anyway, so this is the set of all ways of seeing a k-dimensional space in an n-dimensional space. This is the set of all ways of sticking a k-dimensional space in an n plus one dimensional space. You should maybe really think of it very concretely of e and a and f to the end. Think of your favorite international space f to the end. V is k dimensional. So that this would be a set of k dimensional subspaces of f to the n plus one and so on. Now what's the what is this process really? May not say anything about it. You may not know what this <laughs> is. It may not be a function that you set. Uh, but we don't worry so much about what type of entity it is, like a hacker operator, or body blocks, or just like. We're all wondering what, what, what's going on here. Well, oh, any, any k dimensional space that is n dimensional space is, in an yeah. obvious way, k dimensional space is set up in n plus one dimensional space. Yeah, for any one of these, there's sort of an obvious one of these. And there's just one. Obvious one. And yeah, you can even think of this as a function because it's going to just one. And that's why I wrote all these ones down here in the Pascal's triangle. You can see there's just one way to go from there to there. Yeah, so, so you can really think of y as a function if you like. But x is a little bit more slippery. So, here we have this set, and here we have this set. And what's the deal here? Yeah, sorry, I mean, adding dimensions to both things here. So it's taking a k dimensional subspace of an n dimensional space and putting it into the k plus one dimensional space of an n plus one dimensional space. Yeah, so I've got a k dimensional space and an n dimensional space, and you've got a k plus one and an n plus one. There's a kind of way to go from here to here, but what, what can you say? What kind of what it is? What, what can you say about it? So there's there are uh, you said there are, and I, I think that's a great 
think I know what you're going to say. Yeah, there's, but what there's, there's not? There's, there's not only one way. Right, there's not just one way to take a k-dimensional subspace of that then and beef it up to becoming a k-dimensional, k plus one-dimensional subspace of that. Yeah, so even if we did, so we need lots of ways, right? If we drew a picture of that, right? So like we had a zero-dimensional space in the two-dimensional space, and then I said, okay, now let's think about beefing up the dimension of both by one. Now let's think about a one-dimensional space sitting inside a three-dimensional space. That's when I was trying to get you to understand this procedure. And we saw, it's when we were calculating the recursive formula for the and we thought, of course, it's not just one way to draw this line. There are lots. Um, how many are there? Just like in this example, for example. Okay. Well, how many the different lines are there? S, the order of S. No, actually, they're not order of S. Actually, the key is the key of the How many ways are there to draw this line for in our NF? Uh, S two or something. Yeah, S two or something. So how? And two about the same standard to it, and what about the same to it? I need a parallel. I'm talking about ways of it. Oh. So in, in your example, you, you're going to you put a plane, a parallel plane above that, and that's the number of elements. Yeah, there's that squared way of taking it. Is that square? Yeah. So that it contains a line. So that it contains a line. Oh, it contains a line. Yeah, there are f squared ways of drawing these two lines. It gives us now a one dimensional space and a three dimensional space where it's coordinate is zero and two. So, how many ways are there to go from here to here? F to the, the from f to the uh, n plus one. N, n. No, you left out. The scale equal to zero there. So. Now, it was S to the N minus K. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so, if you look at the Pascal triangle that I, yeah. that I was drawing before, where I was drawing this, these two processes over and over, I always said, I always had one going this way, and I had variable things going this way, and the thing in general was, this was like the NK slot here. Yeah. So you Q to the N minus there's two to the n minus k ways of extending this sort of subspace of this to this sort of subspace of this if you're in the field with q elements. So, so anyway, I hope you see that that's intimately related to this commutation relation. Right? So I'm saying there's always one way to go this way, q to the n minus k ways to extend it to this. How many ways does it extend from this one to this one? Okay, this process is sort of like this process, but it's just the numbers of it. You would then minus one more on the line. Yes, one more. Excuse the n minus k on n plus one. Plus one. So, so when we go around here, we get a certain power of q, and when we go around here, we get one more power of q. And that's the same thing that you keep on saying again about the quantum plane. That, that going around this way, that's sort of different than going around this way. It's a factor of a huge difference. But, okay, so you're supposed to think about all this stuff, but you're supposed to be dying to know what the heck this, these things, X and Y, are. What type of entity are they? There's only this, what the heck <laughs> kind of operator is this? Yeah, that's right. So, 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 this one, we were able to say, oh, it's a function, because for each one of these, we were able to get specific one of those. But here, for one of these, we were able to get a whole bunch of those. So it's not a function anymore. What do you call a thing like that? So you've got two sets, a thing going from one set to another, but it's even not. It's not a function. It could send one thing to a whole bunch of things. It's not a multi-value function, which is sort of like, Non-commutative house function, but not a function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You call it a multi value function, but people usually call it a relation. The relation just says that for any one of these guys, there's some set of these guys that are related to you. 
ريكا سربيكا فلاتيس كان في دار and the draft function is sometimes, you know, draw them as some funny kind of, you know. What they really are is their functions, sorry, their relations. So, so x plus y, you know, this is quantum in the sense that when you start with the you know, a function that you would as a Right, right. It's like that. It's not like you know for sure where you're going. You're going to find a bunch of choices of where, what, what, what are they allowed on this is very related to the it's not matrices of complex numbers, which are the operators that you can talk It's really matrices of zeros and ones. That's what a relation is, right? A relation between the set X and the set Y is just an X times Y shaped box of zeros and ones. We put zeros where the relation is false and one where the relation is true. So Jim was doing that, right? When you were, I think when you were like introducing the heck operators, you were like drawing these boxes and zeros and ones. Those are relations. Yeah. So the relations between sets, these various sets here, but they're not just any old relations. The relations that are invariant or equivariant under a group action. What group action? Well, you have to sort of decide which group action. But here, there's some obvious group acting on this, which is what? GLNF. GLNF. So GLN is acting. You wanted to act on all of them. So GLN certainly acts on this one, and therefore it acts on, on these ones. Of course, GLN plus 2 also acts on this, but, but if we're trying to talk about a relation being invariant, we need to think about the same group that both on both sets. Now the GLN certainly acts on all of these. Oh. I mean, because GLN acts on F to the N plus 1, where it only messes around the first N force, so you need to allow the one that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, so they're all invariant under the action of GLN F. So these are these kind of invariant relations that Jim was talking about, which he said, give you hack operators. So whenever you have two sets and a group acting on them, you can talk about the invariant relations between them. Turn those into operators from the permutation representation to the permutation relation representation. And those are intertwining operators called hack operators. So this, so this formula that I keep writing down that says, x, y equals q, y, x. It should really be some relation between heck operators. Let me get it all the way down. And just to, do you mean that between very literally or is that up for interpretation? Uh, what dubiousness are you wondering about? I don't know. I'm just a little bit confused, but I'll, I'll, I'll think well, about it. Well, yeah, I don't think it, yeah, at least lots of room for, I'm just trying to sketch what's going on. Okay. So I just wanted to mention one other thing, because it's this thing that Furuba keeps pestering me about, which is that he keeps wanting me to tell you, but I want to know about it. Oh, he wants to know. Yeah. The, the relation. Why is it true that we have this kind of symmetry in our formula for Q binomial coefficients, even though the definition of them looks very asymmetrical, but the right very asymmetrical way. My point is that what we should really do is think about categorifying that too. So think about the set of these guys and the set of these guys. And we can try to get this equation by some kind of isomorphism. Some kind of thing going from here to here, but it's not a bijection. You, I mean, there are ways to get bijections. But what we want to get is something that's completely invariant under the action of GLN. 
And there's no bijection between this and this business invariant under the action of the ELF. So you something about the book space and the or something? Right. I mean, if you had an inner product on the n dimensional space, you could send any k dimensional space to its orthogonal complement. Yeah, but you can zero in the case anyway. Oh, that's true. You can like that. But I don't want to. What I want to say is what we're going to do is we're going to get one of these relations between these, one of these Hecke operators from there to there. It's going to be an isomorphism. But not a function, it's a relation. But that trick with the dual vector space is perfectly good for getting the d category by equation on top. Sure. The trick of the dual vector space is perfectly good. Even my own more stupid trick of, of picking an inner product on the space, sending any k dimensional space to its orthogonal complement, which yeah. is n minus k dimensional. That's, so picking inner product reduces the symmetry here, but it's still enough to prove the equation. So, but we'd like to get the equation in the nicest possible way. And so I think that the nicest possible way is going to involve a heck operator from here. So, so what we're doing, you see, is we're going to start understanding the binomial theorem and other things like that. But at a categorized level, we 